All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the IBPF webinar. Today, you will hear from a panel of four who will be discussing how mental health issues and treatment are portrayed in young adult literature and other media. Today, our panel includes Karen Fortunati, who graduated from the University of Scranton and received her law degree from Georgetown University. After practicing law for many years, she began writing her first young adult novel, The Weight of Zero, which focuses on a young woman's struggle with a bipolar condition. Dr. Frank Fortunati, who received a pharmacy and law degree from Rutgers, he later received a degree in psychiatry and is currently the medical director at Yale New Haven Psychiatric Hospital and Associate Chief of Psychiatry at Yale New Haven Hospital. Next, Amanda McGregor holds a master's degree in children's literature and she is currently a contributor to the School Library Journal, Network Blog Teen Librarian Toolbox, where she has worked on a year-long mental health in young adult literature project and she re reviews books for the School Library Journal. And we have Jaina Shaw, who holds a BA in art history from the University of Minnesota and a master's in library and information science from the College of St. Catherine. She is currently a teen services librarian in Connecticut and has been for over 10 years. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and um, for this discussion. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. All right, we're ready to go. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Fortunati, and I'm going to be doing the moderating of our panel today. We're really glad to be here to discuss uh, mental health representation in young adult literature. Uh, the common abbreviation for young adult is YA, so I just wanted to give you a heads up in case you hear us using that term, YA. It stands for young adult literature. Um, before we get into the heart of our discussion books, I'm going to turn it over to Frank. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about just some general statistics about adolescents and mental health. So uh, here's Frank. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. So as uh, it might have been said in the beginning, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I've been practicing child and adolescent psychiatry for now about 20 years. And um, and uh, you know the way that uh, I, I find often mental illness is depicted in in the, uh, literature or in movies is is often not reality based. And I know I'm often speaking with uh, kids that I work with that uh, have a lot of uh, misconceptions about mental illness based upon things that they read or based upon movies. So I think what I'd like to do is just uh, give an overview about uh, mental health issues in, in adolescence and a brief inter, uh, overview since I, I'm going to assume that given the audience that, that many folks who are involved in or who are listening already know most of these statistics uh, anyway. So I think that, uh, these slides are largely based from the uh, National Institute of Mental Health or from NAMI that's uh, collated a lot of data. And, just as an overview, uh, we know that about 20% of kids aged 13 through 18 live with some type of a, a mental health condi condition. Now, many of that might be a conduct disorder or, um, or ADHD, but at least 11% of kids in that age range have, have a mood uh, disorder, and uh, often um, as much as 8% or more may have, have an anxiety disorder. So uh, the impact is, is large. It, again, uh, uh, most individuals who end up with a, a, some, some symptoms of a, of a mental illness will have some, or individuals who end up with a diagnosis will have symptoms of, a, of an illness beginning uh, usually in, in adolescence. And I know, uh, you know clearly uh, with the, the, this audience, I think you know it's very well understood now that many individuals who uh, have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder as an adult have started to show symptoms of bipolar disorder at a much younger age. It's often missed, and that's you know one of the most vexing problems in child and adolescent psychiatry is identifying uh, bipolar disorder earlier. And the average you know delay between onset of symptoms and someone actually receiving intervention, you know, is is 
is staggering. And, there, and there's reports of this really being uh, quite varied, as, as many people know, in as much as eight to ten years at times. Uh, uh, many students who have a, a disorder will drop out of school, uh, and so that really results to in, in, a, in uh, a large ex expense uh, for our our our, um, our communities with uh, people who are underachieving, largely uh, related due to the 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 impact of their mental illness, and a lot of it you know, may be stigma related as well, and. We all know that uh, youth who are in our juvenile justice system are really um, uh, frequently have a mental illness, and essentially those with a mental illness in our juvenile justice system, as well as in our adult uh, justice systems, are disproportionately represented by individuals who have adults or who have a mental illness. Uh, this statistic: uh, that suicide is the third leading cause of death in in youth age 10 to 24, may individuals probably know that this has now uh, changed in, in, in its uh, suicide is in the last couple of years uh, from statistics from uh, you know, various government um, uh, uh, data sources have now have suicide as the second leading cause of death in this, in, in this age group. Uh, which is really uh, staggering, and when you look at these things on a graph, that to see how suicide has actually climbed and really climbed in the, in a younger age range uh, as well, in the 10 to 14 year old age range, suicide has been, has been rising in this age group, while accidents have really plummeted, or and homicides rather have gone uh, have, have dropped out. Uh, of this age group, uh, leading suicide to be the second leading cause of death. So this is, uh, you know, identifying mental illness early and in teenage years is is very important. So why well, I, I think uh, identifying how we depict it in literature is also important. Go ahead. Oh, okay. And you know many of these kids in this age range receive no, you know, no treatment whatsoever. Uh, uh, in some, uh, NAMI has statistics that about half of kids with a mental illness in this age range will re will have received no treatment within the previous year. And I, I think you know, incidentally, in our own state where we're we're in Connecticut right now, these numbers are improving somewhat, but. Um, there's still a large need for more services and uh, access to care. Thank you. So these are really uh, sobering statistics, um, and it just uh, underscores the importance for the role, for the need um, of accurate and respectful and authentic representation of these issues in uh, in literature. Now let's get to it. When we talk about young adult literature. Uh, what exactly do we mean? And Amanda, I'm going to throw this question your way. Sure. When we talk about young adult literature, we're talking about books that are written for teenagers ages 12 to 18 that encompass all genres. Young adult literature is about teenage experiences. It stars teenage protagonists, and it's stories that speak to teenagers and their realities. Now, we know, uh, given our um, experience, that young adult literature covers a very vast uh, array of topics. Um, Jaina, uh, can you give us your input on, on what you've seen over the course of the last 10 years in terms of what YA is covering? Um, I think lately, especially, we're moving away from genre fiction. Um, you know, 10 years ago, it was uh, you know, vampires, and then it was sci-fi, and now I feel like teens are really going for the, you know, just realistic fiction, things about relationships, things about personal experience. Um, one of the best trends I've been seeing in YA Lit is writing characters that are not defined by their otherness. So, you know, 15 years ago, you know, if you think about a book like Perks of Being a Wallflower, if a book had a gay character, it was likely the entire story was about that character struggling with coming out. 
but now there's more nuanced approaches where being gay isn't defined as a crisis. However, mental illness in YA lit really needs to catch up. Obviously, it's very important to highlight the crisis nature of this issue. You don't want to treat it casually. Um, but I'm hoping in the next decade we'll have more stories with characters who are living with their illness and having a story outside of that. Thank you. Now, um, uh, on the screen, we just have some of some things that are covered. This, of course, is in, uh, doesn't include everything, but really, there's there are very few topics that are not covered. So we have things like sexuality, gender identity, abuse, neglect, dating violence, rape, ethnicity issues, racism, um, and it goes on. And with regard to mental health issues, it's just as broad, which we're all really thankful for. Uh, depression, anxiety, suicide, eating disorders, bipolar. So it's really... Um, YA is very bold, and uh, and and it takes a lot of risks. And it, it, um, so these representations, though, need to be authentic and and respectful, so they don't do uh, so they're not dangerous or don't do a disservice to the teens who are who are reading them. Um, Amanda, what are your thoughts on the diversity of YA books? Uh, I like that we're starting to see more and more inclusive stories because there is no one universal teen experience and authors are working harder than ever to present new and innovative stories that feature this diversity, especially when it comes to mental health. We're finally seeing characters who have a wide variety of mental health issues. We're seeing various treatment approaches and successes and failures, and we're not getting what used to be a very one-note story of mental health, which was mental health is depression, and that is going to equal suicide, and that's not the story we're seeing anymore. Thanks. Now, what I um, think is critical for, um, uh, for this discussion is that you guys have been in the fields working with teens at uh, uh, and you know, seeing what they like to read, what they don't like to read, what resonates with them. Um, Jaina, why did you get into or specialize in young adult uh, literature? Um, kind of in a roundabout way, when I got my master's in library science, um, gosh, 11 years ago, there just I'm from Minnesota, which actually is where Amanda is sitting right now. But, um, I couldn't find a job, and I took a job at a for-profit college. And it, I really liked the students, but there was just no room for programming or outreach or anything like that. So I kind of, you know, thought about going into teen librarianship. Uh, Ten years ago was really a time when a lot of libraries were first adding that position uh, to their staff. So I just kind of, you know, I mean, like, to be honest, I was a little manic. <laughs> I'll come out as bipolar. Um, just randomly applying all over the country, and I actually got a job in Connecticut, and that's where I ended up. Now, uh, Amanda, uh, you currently you're not working as a as a YA librarian, but you had in the past. What what um what pulled you towards the field? Uh, my master's degree is in children's and young adult literature, so from a literature standpoint, um, I was interested in that age range, um, but I really connect with teenagers. I feel like I'm a perpetual adolescent, even though I'm turning 40 this year, um, and I also feel like I have never fully recovered from my own teen years. And I think for anyone who works with youth, we have specific age ranges that we just really connect to, and that's always been teenagers for me. And I've always seen the importance of young adult literature as being a vital resource for teenagers, whether that's to see someone like themselves or to see the world in ways completely new to them and want to do everything that I can to connect books to teenagers and help support and respect them as people. Thanks. Now, you also do something that's, um, that's really interesting. You work on a, um, uh, it's called the Teen Librarian Toolbox. Can you explain what that is? Yes, uh, Teen Librarian Toolbox is a website. We are networked with School Library Journal. School Library Journal is one of the big uh, re review journals in our field. 
Um, and our mission is to help libraries serving teenagers and anyone who cares about teenagers and to foster a community of professional development and resource sharing by providing quality information and discussions and reviews. And each year we choose to focus on a project. Um, last year, the project that we focused on was mental health in young adult literature. We wanted to help the young adult community engage in a wider conversation about mental health to help remove shame, silence, and stigma, and to show teens that they're not alone. The characters in books are getting help. They're seeing what their options are. The real humans, we're surviving our illnesses. We're getting help. We're opening up about our lives. We're living with mental illness, and we're here to say, there is hope, and you can live with this. You can talk about it. You can ask for help, and you can treat this. Well, we did the project last year, we had over 100 guest posts from authors, bloggers, librarians, and other teen advocates. Most of them were writers sharing their, sharing their own personal experiences. Information about that project can be found under the Projects tab on teenlibrariantoolbox.com or by searching the hashtag, hashtag MHYALit on the blog. Great, thank you. This really is an amazing um, project. I was lucky enough to um, to uh, participate in it, and I absolutely loved reading it. It it takes you further inside um, a lot of these novels in terms of the author's own personal experiences with different mental health issues, and it really um, I think it does wonders for um, opening up the discussion, uh, increasing the dialogue. Um, and, and just works to further decrease uh, stigma. So now let's move on to the heart of our discussion today. And that question is, why do we need these books? Why is mental health representation so critical for young readers? Um, so given that you've, you've worked with, with teen readers, Amanda, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on why that these books are so necessary? I think seeing an increase in these books is absolutely vital for teenagers. Unfortunately, so much of mental health is still surrounded by silence, shame, and stigma. And the more books there are, and the more people there are willing to openly discuss their own mental health issues, the easier it is to see the importance of appropriate mental health treatment and to help remove the stigma. Because one in five teenagers will be diagnosed with some type of mental health issue, as we talked about at the beginning of this, these conversations are vital. Many teens are not talking to others about their mental health. They might feel alone. They may literally not know how to begin this conversation or what help is available. And while the teen reader may not necessarily have a mental health issue, surely someone in their sphere does. We need these books to not just exist, but to be well-researched and feature diverse representation. These stories help teenagers understand themselves, their friends, their family, and more. These stories can give hope and validate experiences. These stories can create compassion and understanding. Now, um, when you and I talked, um, you had mentioned that dealing with teens at different um, library events, uh, you presented at Teen Lit Con and Nerd Con, um, people come up to you, right? And they, yes. and they uh, what, what kind of things do they tell you? Uh, whether it's just been casually through recommending books in the library or facilitating book clubs or doing these more formal presentations, every time I have either teenagers or parents of teenagers who come up to me and it, with the teenagers often they're saying, thank you so much for talking about this no one talks to me about this and I have anxiety disorder and they start to sort of unload on me um, with what they're dealing with and no one is reaching out to them and they don't know that they can talk to anyone about it and in the case of parents they're saying thank you for letting me know these books are here I think this is really important for my child who also has a similar disorder to be able to see themselves so it's showing how powerful this can be right it opens the door to, to these conversations yep. Uh, Jaina, what about you in terms of your experience um, working with teens and, and, and these books? You know, it's, it's varied and you know, I'm just suddenly thinking about, um, we, last year I had a uh, YA for adults book club and we read All the Bright Places and the timing of it was 
not the best because a pretty well-loved teacher at the high school had recently committed suicide and I feel like the majority of the book group just never even made it to the end because they thought like this is disrespectful I can't read about suicide and I think that there's you know some pushback with people just don't want to read about it at all I know there was some talk of you know the, Patri the Patricia McCormick novel cut that came out about um, cutting a few years back you know some people said it triggered them to want to cut so I mean we'll kind of get into that but I think what I'm seeing in the last couple of years is teens live so publicly and I think that brings pressure to appear a certain way um, I mean we all do and even when I see social media posts addressing someone's like quote imperfect life they focus on these kind of cute buzzfeed ways of being imperfect such as you know, I'm eating pizza and this, I'm going to the gym. But you don't see people posting a picture on, on Instagram with the caption like, I haven't gotten out of bed in two days because I'm depressed. Or, whoops, I charged a thousand dollars on my credit card because I thought I was going to take up ballroom dancing at 3 a.m. Hashtag manic. The first thing that people never think about is the private experience of books. Um, I can't say enough about that. In a world of social media and helicopter parents, books may be one of the last places that somebody can have a private time to really think about issues on their own. And that's why I think it's so important to show mental health issues in YA Lit. Um, it could be a way for a teen to recognize that they might be struggling themselves or that they're not alone in the way they're feeling. And yeah. I think that's an, just a fabulous point. Um, as a parent myself, uh, I see kids really can't disconnect anymore. The phones are always a part of their hand, and um, I love that you brought that up, that reading a book is such a, it's probably one of the few private experiences left now. Um, and, uh, you know, again, um, just um, reinforces how critical um, these stories are. Um, now, what I wanted to share with you was the feedback that I've gotten from my book, um, The Way to Zero. Um, I wrote The Way to Zero in about a year, and it came out last October. And real briefly, the story is about a 17-year-old girl named Catherine, who when the story begins, she's in an extremely dark place. She's lost her friends. Her grandmother has died. She's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and she fears the return of her depression, the depression that she calls zero. And she feels that a life like this isn't worth living, so she uh, devises a suicide plan. Now, what the story is about is how this suicide plan gets derailed, because things start to happen in Catherine's life that she never expected, never saw coming. And these are good things. Uh, she connects with a psychiatrist, and this is her second psychiatrist, the first one she didn't really have a bond with. Um, she's on a medication that, uh, that is working this time as compared to previous medications she was on. Um, she's in an intensive outpatient program, and she's connecting with the kids in this group. Um, her mother is getting a handle on her own anxiety, and uh, the two of them together uh, work through this, this struggle to understand what this diagnosis of bipolar disorder means. So it is, um, the, the story focuses very much on healing and grief and recovery and what a good support network looks like. Um, so it's, it's ultimately, um, it's a story of hope. Now, um, I've been getting a common theme in the feedback that I'm, I've been getting is this, um, I'm not alone, or the one I posted here, these are all from, from people who, who wrote to me or posted on Twitter or Instagram. I'm not alone as I thought. Um, it's a much needed YA book. Someone wrote, I have bipolar disorder and I'm reading The Way to Zero right now and I've never felt more connected to a story. Um, this one talks about connecting with this depiction of depression based on personal experience. Um, I carry the bipolar gene. The men in my family are bipolar. I deal with depression. 
and that, that she could relate to this particular depiction. Now, um, you know, hearing Jaina and Amanda talk about, you know, kids coming up to them um, and, and grateful that these books are out there, um, I can tell you that uh, when I started talking to people about the book last year, uh, probably last January, um, uh, I would have, I would, I've been floored basically by the reaction. I never expected it because what would happen is I would give a brief description of what the story was about and the person I was talking to, the expression on their face would change and immediately, I, I'd say between 90 and 95 percent of the time, the reaction was, oh, I have bipolar, oh, I, ha I struggle with anxiety or depression or you fill in the blank or my mother has it, my daughter has it, my sister has it. So I felt like this story just opened the door so easily to very honest and real conversations about mental health. And that was the goal when I was writing it, but to see it happen, to actually see it happen and then to get this kind of feedback, it was just, it was, it was really incredible. Um, and then this last quote was, you know, I just thought nailed it. Um, what the, the theme that we've been focusing on about why these stories are mattered. This was one, this is a, a review I got back. This is such an important book. As a kid, I didn't have any books like this at my fingertips. I was pretty well read, but if these books were out there, I sure had no way of finding them. I had shelves of books about teenagers dying of cancer, being shipwrecked, going missing, having adventures. I don't think I ever had a book that said, sometimes you will be desperately sad, but there is a way out. Maybe I still would have been too scared to say anything, but at least I would have felt a bit less alone. So I feel like in some cases, these books can be lifelines for kids who, who don't see a way out. Um, so what I want to talk about is some books that Jaina and Amanda and I absolutely loved, felt they were spot on in their portrayals, um, they gave, they, they avoided tropes, they avoided dangerous stereotypes, and they gave really authentic, genuine uh, representations of both illness and equally important treatment and varied treatment. So um, the first, uh, these books that we're going to talk about now are books that we loved and, uh, and think just did a, a spectacular job. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Amanda, for the for the first book, When We Collided. Sure. When We Collided is by Emery Lord, and it's about a girl named Vivi who is nearly 17, and she has bipolar disorder, but she would rather not deal with it. Unfortunately, it turns out that ignoring something is not actually an, an effective way to manage it, and throwing your lithium pills into the ocean is not exactly the same thing as ingesting them. So predictably, Vivi gets much worse. She's manic and unpredictable and volatile, She's often in overdrive, she's erratic, she doesn't sleep, and it's very clear how destructive her choices are. When she finally does begin to get some help, she explains to her doctor why she didn't like the lithium. He tells her it was only one medication at one dose, and it takes time to figure out what works best for someone. He also tells her that her diagnosis is just one part of her, a part that she will need to learn to accept. As readers, we clearly see how bipolar disorder affects her life and the lives of those who love her, how being untreated and unmedicated is harmful. And while it's clear that she's very sick, it feels ultimately hopeful that she will be better taken care of and that she will take better care of herself in the future. Yeah, I, I think you did a, just a great job of summarizing the, the brilliance of this story. And I also like that you hit upon um, it shows mental health, mental illness in different ways, treated and untreated. And I just thought the book was fabulous because it's not just one character who is dealing with a mental health issue. There's a number of characters, maybe four, um, at least four, uh, uh, in, in treated and untreated and, and varied stages. So I just thought that was really realistic because Right, that's what most of our lives are like. Um, in my own life, you know, that's many family and friends are dealing with different things. So I just, I just thought that was that was terrific. 
Um, the next story is uh, the next book that we liked is it's kind of a funny story. And Jaina, can you uh, can you talk about this one? This book deals more, I think, with depression. What and actually looking back, I think this is pretty much the book that kind of inspired me to identify my own mental health issues. And um, I think it's uh, the main character. It's sort of a uh, fictional memoir of a teenager who is kind of cycling through periods of depression and, you know, ends up checking himself into a hospital. And there's a movie of it and everything. Um, I think the thing that struck me the most, and I was actually rereading it this morning, was that he recognizes that he's having suicidal ideations. He has kind of a specific plan for it. And before he goes through with it, he reaches out to the suicide hotline. And they say, you know, this is an emergency. You should go to the hospital. And he took himself there. And I think that's really empowering for teens to see that, that you don't need someone to rescue you. You don't need your parents. I mean, you need your parents. But um, that I think that he felt empowered to take charge of his own mental health. Um, the, sad part of this is the, the, the author, Ned Dizzini, struggled with uh, depression himself, and he actually committed suicide a couple years ago. But I think that reflects on the story in a way that when you walk away from this, you realize there's not one cure. If you're feeling great and you've corrected yourself, it's, you know, any sort of mental health disorder, you have to be constantly on top of it and things can change pretty fast. Right. It's chronic. Mm -hmm. it's chronic and, and uh, uh, as you noted, you, you have to be vigilant. Um, yeah, that that's another, you know, fabulous book and I do love that aspect that you've highlighted, this um, self-reliance, uh, especially in this case, you know, calling 911. Um, Amanda, you liked um, this next book, The Rest of Us Just Live Here. Yes, uh, this is by Patrick Ness and is one of my favorite books of the past few years, period. Uh, but the depiction of mental health is really great. I was cheering out loud while I was reading it. The characters have frank discussions about mental health, therapy, and medication. One of the main characters, Mike, talks to his therapist about how awful the OCD is, how debilitating the anxiety dis how the anxiety feels, how he worries that if he can't break himself out of a loop, the only way to end it will be to kill himself. His struggles are very much on the page and he wrestles with what to do to overcome them. His therapist says he'd like to start him back on some medication and Mike makes a face. And this is from the book. Why are you making that face? Medication. Medication is a failure? The biggest one. Like I'm so broken I need medical help. And the therapist says, can't Cancer patients don't call chemo chemotherapy a failure. Diabetics don't call insulin a failure. And his therapist goes on to ask why he feels responsible for his anxiety. During their discussion, he says to Mike, medication will address the anxiety, not get rid of it, but reduce it to a manageable level, maybe even the same level as other people, so that, and here's the key thing, we can talk about it, make it something you can live with. You still have work to do, but the medication lets you stay alive long enough to do that work. As a person with anxiety disorder and depression myself, as a parent raising a kid in therapy and on medication for anxiety disorder, as someone deeply invested in wanting teenagers to understand that there is help for depression or anxiety or whatever, I applaud these scenes in this book. It never feels preachy, preachy or forced. Mikey is honest, his friends are compassionate, and the therapist is effective and optimistic. Yeah, I have to read this one. Um, what I love, what you pointed out, was the therapist's um, explanation of the goals of medication. He says, medication will address the anxiety, not get rid of it, but reduce it to a manageable level. Frank, can you speak to that in terms of the, the necessity of advising or have, making a patient, making sure a patient is aware of, of what the expectations of what medicine can do. Well, sure, thank you. So I, I think not only that point about the expectations of what medications can do, but 
and I haven't read this book, but Amanda, based on your description, what what I really would also take away from this is the expectations of what your relationship uh, would be like with someone who's prescribing medications for you or, or treating you or, or therapy. Because I think what I find repeatedly when I'm meeting with folks is that they may have stuck with someone for a very long time where they did not have a good rapport because they don't have anything to base it upon. They don't have anything to compare it to. You you can't really go and look at the J.D. Power survey like you can when you're buying an automobile and, and uh, you know, you know a good restaurant when you go to a restaurant and a good uh, a server. Uh, but when you're, you, you know, since we're not really speaking about uh, mental health treatments in, in as openly, I think many people just don't know what to expect and accept things that they likely shouldn't accept. So that depiction that you're describing where a, a, a therapist uh, lays out what to expect from medications and the role of medications is is really, uh, I think, very nice and very helpful in how these, these books you know, might help. I, I might say that with, with Karen's you know, book, the story that Karen has uh, with the protagonist, Catherine, was 100% completely her story, but the scenes of the interactions with the psychiatrist, uh, you know, are, are really influenced by, you know, my, uh, her asking me how I might respond to a particular situation in, in a session, and I, I think um, depictions like what you're pointing out, Amanda, are just really um, helpful to arm kids to, and, and adults for that matter to know what to expect and, and what to demand from a provider. Great, thank you. Uh, one book that I, I absolutely loved um, is this one, Underwater by um, Marissa Reichardt. And real quickly, um, the main character is suffering from panic attacks, agoraphobia, uh, from a very traumatic incident at school. and. Um, She's, she's um, basically uh, limited to her apartment. She really can't leave it. And what, um, what this book highlights is healing and recovery. Um, Morgan has a tremendous support network, a mother, a brother, and a friend. Uh, and her psychologist is also a huge piece of that. She's a partner in Morgan's recovery and they take it step by step literally with only a few steps to get Morgan outside of her apartment in terms of getting over her fear and her anxiety. Um, the therapy in this story absolutely shines um, and uh, the author avoids uh, a common trope um, that we see unfortunately sometimes and, and that love will save Love will save and heal the main character's mental health issues, and the, this is the farthest thing from from that in this story. Um, she very respectfully handles this relationship, um, showcases how it's not just Morgan suffering, but but others around her. So I just this story I just thought was brilliant. Um, the next one, uh, Amanda, you liked is the symptoms of being human. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold still. Yeah, that's me, so Dana. Um, I'm going to talk about 13 reasons why in our, you know, discussion of books we don't like. I feel like Hold Still is the anti-13 reasons why. Um, it actually is told primarily in flashbacks and in journal entries. Um, it's a girl suddenly loses her best friend to suicide, and she's trying to sort of piece together what happened. Her friend has left her journal underneath her bed, um, hoping her friend would find it. And I think, you know, when you are going through suicidal ideations, something that your brain is telling you is you're a burden on people, it will be easier if you go, your family will be better off without you, your friends will be. And I think the main character in the story is struggling so much with just the loss of her friend and, you know, how she could have missed certain things. And so I think it's important to, for teens to see that, you know, there are consequences if you decide to commit suicide. And I think this is a really, it's really well done in a really respectful way. 
Thank you. Um, now, Amanda, you did um, you reviewed the symptoms of being human. Right. This book is by Jeff Garvin, and again, I like this because of the positive depiction of therapy and medication and getting help. Um, Riley, the gender fluid main character, has recently attempted suicide and had a recovery stint in a psychiatric hospital. Riley's anxiety and panic attacks are described in great detail, and they are a constant in Riley's life, but medication and therapy are helping with that. We see Riley getting help complete with adjusting doses of medication as things change and having backup medications for the particularly bad moments and learning different techniques to stave off anxiety like deep breathing or visualization. Riley and the therapist interactions are honest and successful and they help demystify what goes on in a therapy session and I think it's important that we see more of these positive therapy interactions in young adult books. Yeah, this, I really like this one. I, 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 was, I was lucky enough to read it. Um, so uh, uh, the next one uh, we're going through, and then we have one more after this, is uh, Girl Pieces. So this is um, by Kathleen Glasgow, New York Times bestseller. This was one of the most profound books that, that I've ever read. Uh, the main character uh, self-harms, and it is a uh, uh, very um, graphic and painful journey into her world. Um, what, um, two things that elevate it, the writing, um, it's, well, it's a very difficult story. It's gorgeous writing. It's very poetic. It's um, very raw. But the beauty of it is despite all the main character's hardships, uh, her father's suicide, best, uh, best friend's attempt, um, uh, a somewhat abusive mother, um, homelessness, with all these odds stacked against this main character, um, she survives and she recovers. So it is, you know, the ultimate story of hope. Now, for the last story we're going to talk that where we give a thumbs up to is um, uh, Memory of Light. And I, I read this one. Amanda's going to talk about it, but I, I just thought this one was superb. So this book is by Francisco X. Stork centered on a group of teenagers in a facility. The main character, Vicky, wakes up in the hospital after she's attempted suicide, and her doctor recommends that she stay for a few weeks for some group therapy and individual therapy and to help out about around the hospital to give them some time to start to think about what medications might be appropriate for her. Vicky is surprised by the gentle but blunt sincerity of the conversations about life in the hospital, mental illness, and more. She's not used to people talking about these things. The teenagers in her group all talk about these very real illnesses and they support each other. They struggle to accept their illnesses, but they're constantly reminded by each other and their doctor that what they have is an illness and it is real. The focus on therapy, medication, and support shows readers that many different, there are many different ways to get help. The mental illnesses are handled sensitively and the teens conversations go a long way toward encouraging open dialogues about mental health and acceptance and the removal of stigma. Great. Um, so now we're going to talk about some tropes or representations that um, are not optimum. Um, uh, tropes like I mentioned before where love cures all. Um, Dangerous generalizations like um, uh, uh, no one will hear you, um, medications are bad. Um, Jaina and Amanda, do you want to weigh in on some of the issues that you have with, with some books? Uh, Jaina? Yeah, sure. And I'll be brief about it because I think we're kind of trying to wrap up a little bit. But, um, you know, this whole Manic Pixie dream world kind of thing that's been, like, it's not as big right now, but it was a really big trend, like this John Green kind of thing for a while, that, you know, these books where you've got kind of a dorky, shy guy, and his life is changed by this crazy, manic, beautiful girl, and, you know, that's not what you should be aspiring to necessarily, and it makes it look like mania is fun and normal, and that it's rebellious. Um, so, yeah, and I think, like, the last thing teenagers that are struggling with mental illness is a book that makes it seem like it's interesting or fun. Good point. Good point. Um, Amanda, do you want to talk about um, a book, um, The Last Time We Say Goodbye? 
Sure. Uh, my biggest problem with this book is that it villainizes medication, which is a common theme in a lot of books, especially a lot of older books. The main character's attitude toward taking medication to help the panic attacks and the depression that she's feeling in the wake of her brother's suicide is very negative. Uh, she tells her therapist about panic attacks and he tells her there's medication for that and goes on to explain what that would mean for her and she refers to him as waxing poetically about drugs. She also then goes on to explain Brave New World to him, telling him about Soma, the drug that's supposed to make everyone happy, and she says how that's not normal, you're supposed to feel things, and if she takes medication, she won't be able to feel things. And I hate seeing this very common notion about medication perpetuated in a book like this, because the best thing that we can do is to help teenagers and everyone suffering from mental illness is to be open and honest and to remove the stigma of both the illness and the different treatments. And for a lot of teenagers, this might be the only place they're seeing a conversation, and I hate for them to read these negative thoughts about medication and walk away thinking nothing can help them. Right. And uh, Jaina, you uh, had, um, had mentioned earlier 13 reasons why. Yeah, I, um, this book is very well written. It's very popular. It's still like a bestseller on Amazon in teen mental health fiction, even though it's about 10 years old. Um, so no, you know, I'm not dissing the author or anything like that, but to put it bluntly, this book makes suicide look awesome. It's, uh, it's about a girl who, who commits suicide and she leaves almost like a scavenger hunt for all of the people who have wronged her on tapes and maps. And so not only does it make it look, I mean, every teenage girl at some point has thought about how to get revenge on somebody that spread a rumor on them and it's just it it makes this look like that is a viable option and that it's kind of fun to do it. Right. And the last one we have is a tragic kind of wonderful. Amanda, what were you up on this? This is by Eric Lindstrom. Um and it's about a girl named Mel, who has bipolar disorder and she somehow manages to hide it from people despite being very, very ill. Uh, she seems defined by her diagnosis. There's not much more to her than being bipolar. And she needs a lot of help, but the message at the end seems to be that David, the boy she likes, is going to help literally and figuratively save her, not medication or therapy or understanding how to better care for herself. She has a terrifying episode near the end of the book, but the takeaway is that David can talk her down and make her stop feeling this way, and they can hold hands and walk away and everything is fine. And that's dangerously untrue because people can't fix people, not like that. Right. I think um, I think overall, though, we're we're seeing less and less of that. Would you agree? Absolutely. Great. So um, to wrap up, I think it's pretty pretty clear that um, YA is bold, and it, it's it's talking about pretty much everything. We're seeing more stories, more illnesses, more treatment options medication choices, types of medications, um, uh, different therapies, and finally we're slowly moving to where the stories of mental illness is not the defining arc, um, and also maybe not even the defining character trait. So um, I think that normalizes it and, and goes a long way in terms of uh, lessening the stigma. Um, any thoughts on wrapping up, Amanda, on that? Uh, just to agree with everything you were saying and that increase in good mental health representation in young adult literature means more teenagers are going to be reading accurate information about what they or someone they know may be going through and that can only be a good thing. And Jana, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think you guys summed up very well. All right, great. And so we're just going to finish up with this um, slide, Amanda, that uh, you brought to our attention. Uh, and Amanda, if, if you wanted to go through it. Uh, uh, there is this statistic that we're looking at here. With treatment treatment after just three months, 71% of children and teenagers with depression and 81% of children and teenagers with anxiety reported improved mental health. So are stories actual treatment? Of course not. But there are ways we can all work to end the silence and stigma of mental illness and maybe that will lead to treatment. 
whether that's reading about characters' experiences or authors, whether it's having books available in a classroom or library or passing them among your friends, or whether that's finding the strength to speak up and share your own story, these stories do make a difference. Great. Terrific. Well, thank you. I think uh, I think we're 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 finished up here. Um, Debbie, if there's questions, we're we're happy to take any. Absolutely. Um, we do have one question in the queue here, and we'll start with this: Are books written about and targeted for college students considered young adult literature? I'll um, take it. There are a couple, you know, and they're more transitional if it's, you know, the students. Um, the one I'm thinking of in particular is Fangirl by Rainbow Rowell, and that is marketed as a YA book even though she's in her freshman year of college. But I think it's more, it's about the character kind of struggling with her own sort of awkward adolescence. Um, but there actually is sort of a new genre out called New Adult, and that is aimed at, you know, 20 something. Okay, thank you. If I can, uh, oh, go ahead, Frank. Did you have something to add? I, 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 yeah, that, that's so interesting about this new genre that you're you're bringing up because something that we're seeing that I'm that I'm seeing now. I, I've primarily been a child and adolescent psychiatrist, but now I'm a medical director of a hospital that has a lot of adults as well, and we've seen a a, a great need for specialized treatment for individuals in that age group, and we actually it's growing. Uh, you know, a, a, a name that we refer to folks in that age group called transitional age youth, largely 16 to 25. You know, maybe predominantly 18 to 25 or stretching to 16 to 25. So it's interesting that parallel that you're seeing with literature as well. Excellent. Thank you for that ad. It looks like right now we don't have any additional questions. Um, I will just remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website and also um, emailed to our um, community. If you happen to be on our email list, on, if you are not, please visit our website and sign up. And again, I th believe that um, if you happen to think of a question um, that you would like answered, after this webinar concludes, you can email me at dbrown at ibpf.org, and I'd be happy to pass that on. And it looks like there are no additional questions, so I'd like to say thank you um, to all of you for your insights and your um, expertise in this area, and we're very happy that you have shared, and um, we hope that this um, continues the conversation and um, that we hope to hear from additional writers um, bringing forth the normalcy of uh, mental health issues, just as we have um, all have physical health issues. Um, thank you, everyone, again, and have a wonderful day. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you.